captured by women is brought to you by yum vita a delicious way to grow and nido 40 grow your love their future Welcome to another exciting day where we bring you Captured by Women on your favorite TV station, TV3. As usual, we are proudly sponsored by Nido, Yam Vita, and GTP. And it's myself, Rosemond, and Noam Falong who's joining us for the very first time. But guys, as usual, we always plan to make it interesting for you because you're staying at home to make sure you watch this episode of Captured by Women. So we have to make it extra, extra nice for you to enjoy. We'll start off by talking about, you know, sex relationships between teachers and their students. This certainly is nothing new. We've been hearing about it time and over. But the problem right now is we're finding out. Is it that we're not addressing it in a very serious manner? Are we making a joke out of it? Maybe that's why it's not catching the attention of government agencies to make sure that implementation of punishments will be deterrent enough. We'll find out what your view is. Then we'll also talk about one year down the line, what the atomic fire and the changes thereof have been. We'll also be looking at it from the victim's perspective and also people who have been in a close relationship and very near to fire outbreaks. We'll find out. Is government giving them the necessary attention or is it that we wait until people cry foul and then we run to their aid or are politicians putting a twist to this whole agenda? We'll also find out what the free SHS implementation one year down the line has been. Are you satisfied? Are there many reasons that people have raised for this thing to have been halted real enough? Should we follow through with the processes or should we just look at what we've been able to do and see if any change will bring a good result? We'll have an educationist in the person of Mr. Hafar to delve into this matter. Then also, we'll entertain a career woman who's doing very well in her field, talking about beauty, fashion, and whatnot. We'll find out what her take is on current trends. Then finally, we'll talk about our health. Breast cancer is something that is killing so many women just because they don't report to the hospital early for early detection and effective treatment. Could you have helped that lady out there who had the diagnosis of breast cancer or did you scare her to die with it? Let's find out. So that's what we have for you today. Stay tuned. Don't go away. On Spin today, we are discussing the issue of teacher-student sexual relationships and whether we are discussing it enough and taking it seriously as a nation. Ladies, this issue is quite appalling. Mm -hmm. We've, it's come up in the past, but it, it keeps coming up. And the numbers keep increasing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I sometimes think that as a country, we're not really doing enough to address the issue. Because sometimes you have these incidences mm -hmm. come up mm -hmm. and we actually make jokes out of exactly. them. Exactly. You see people on social media having fun with it. Mm -hmm. But we forget that there's a victim in all of this who will probably be traumatized, whose education may be affected, mm -hmm. and eventually her quality of life, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because you probably cut short her education. And often you hear that uh, the teacher has been disciplined by the school or the Ghana Education Service. Has been transferred or, they, or, something. or they get transferred mm -hmm. to a different mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the the punishment is not strong enough to deter any of you know anyone mm -hmm. any offender. Mm -hmm. Because if the only punishment I'll get is a simple transfer, uh, there's there's a but problem some have been sacked though. Mm -hmm. I think some. I'm with some. Some. But not there's enough few. sacking. Yes. It should know, be the default. Yeah. You know that mm -hmm. once you're found guilty, mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. So once you're found guilty you would actually, they don't have licenses, but your license will be revoked, mm -hmm. and then you are not allowed to mm -hmm. practice as a teacher mm -hmm. anymore, mm -hmm. because then the children in your care are in danger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the only way we'll be able to achieve some semblance mm -hmm. of change mm -hmm. in our institutions. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and I feel like when you just get transferred, uh, they say when, when you transfer a, a drunkard, mm -hmm. you have only changed his location. Yes, mm -hmm. <laughs> so he, you've changed his office. Mm -hmm. So he's going to go to the new location mm -hmm. and continue mm -hmm. with what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Amma, yeah, what's your take? <laughs> it's a very worrying mm -hmm. situation. I think Falonga said it all. My problem is, as a nation, we just don't take it serious. Because you've got social media, which is such a powerful tool, which should be able to bring change. 
but instead we find people making mockery of such situations. I remember not too long ago we had this stool issue Shoe where stool. now it became actually yes. fun. People will laugh about the fact that someone has gone to take a stool and is presenting it as a you know bride price issue. I mean, that for me was a low point because I thought that was where we'll start discussing it as a serious matter, mm -hmm. and then now it's transcended to schools. It's not new when it comes to the schools, but the point is, does it mean that teachers would continually do it because they know that nothing changes? After right. all, you transfer me or you put me out there in the news one or two days, mm -hmm. it's over. Mm -hmm. How many times will we read the news to hear that these mm -hmm. teachers are being listed and public is being reminded mm -hmm. of what they've done in mm -hmm. times past mm -hmm. even? Because for me, if I don't encounter that teacher on a personal note, I probably wouldn't even recognize him if I see him on the, in another school. Right. When these transfers happen, they are not public knowledge enough to even identify that teacher A is the same person who has gone to this new location and so beware of him. And equally for the new people to also keep a tab on him and even see whether he would still continue this act. Because I believe, of course, maybe there's room for the change when it comes to with the GES. Mm -hmm. Because I believe there's a shortfall. That's how come teachers will even be transferred. If we had enough teachers, probably they'll be sacked outright. But that whole thing where we push it under the carpet and say investigations are ongoing. And for God knows how many years, investigations are ongoing. We never get to know the results. And that victim still has to live with it. We've got people who don't finish university because the teacher asked them to sleep with. And if you don't do it, you're great. We had recent issues where UPSA, mm -hmm. it's been mentioned. We've had Lagos, all the universities, you can tell. So is it that we just don't care? And again, we have to talk about where the victims come and speak up. Do we yeah. listen to them? Yeah. Are their voices heard enough? Otherwise, everyone dies with their story. Even in U.S., where you think that with all their laws and all the things that have gone forward, we're still having mm -hmm. a sex yeah. scandal and it's still an issue. Mm -hmm. So I think we as a nation, with all our many issues, this is one of the big things we have to address. I mean, for me, you can't I allow mean, it to cripple education. Yeah, for me, I look at it from the perspective of the home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how parents are also preparing their children for, for the, uh, the transitions in their life. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, taking it at the secondary level, you know your daughter is going, or your children are going to mm -hmm. school. What kind of sexual education are they giving at them. school? How yeah. do they teach them about sexual harassment? That What do you look out for? What do you do when somebody is making you uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. So it also comes back to us, the responsibility of parents and societies, mm -hmm. you know, to teach the children at home yes. what constitutes sexual harassment, mm -hmm. sexual assault, and what you need to do. And so I think that it's also it's even at the teaching. Yeah. Yes. For the parents to open the platform exactly. for their children to, to communicate. Speak exactly. Because yes. many people I've met in the mm -hmm. hospitals who come with these mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. it's not the fact that they didn't tell anyone, mm -hmm. but the response they get yes. from yes. Oh, yeah, from the Why does he have to be what right. you wore yeah. or what you yeah. you can be fully clothed and if someone has That's a mental, mental problem and has decided to rape you yeah. he will get away yeah. with it yeah. so yeah. the yeah. parents should be encouraging yeah. enough yeah. to ask okay so when you went and the teacher touched you this way mm. what did you do mm. yes. and what happened yeah. did you report to mm. anyone else? Be able to that conversation yeah. should keep it going it's true and the gs also you know the gs also has a key role to play what systems do they have in in, in place and what can they do to eliminate uh, the problem and this, not yeah. just the gs i think the schools also have a role to play and there's this conversation around uh universities publishing the names of offenders mm -hmm. which i think is a very good mm. idea yeah. Yeah. because as a parent you can never prepare your child enough for the advances of a predator mm -hmm. especially an experienced predator <laughs> so i think what schools should do is put down the names of offenders, people who have a history of, you know, such abuse, and let all the students have access to this information. Hmm. So the person knows that, oh, Charlie, people's eyes are on me. So, the, you know, you be careful. Hmm. And then the students are also aware that this teacher, you know, this is his character, and this is something that he usually hmm. does. Hmm. So they can also prepare their defense, because a teacher is in a power position. You know, you walk into a lecturer's office, he holds a key to your graduation, and there are so many of them who coerce mm. you in a way that you have no option but to give in. And in that instance, you really cannot blame the student. Mm. It's, 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 it's certainly a topic that we'll pick up again, because as you can see, it's very serious. It's something that we need to nip in the bud. And everybody has a role to play, the GES, parents, the school system itself, mm -hmm. to eliminate this appalling trend that is becoming normal. We'll continue with the show after this break. October 17, 2017 remains a day that will be marked in the annals of our history of Ghana because an atomic gas explosion occurred and everyone remembers that day because children in the Presex school were shaking and many people living around the area had to run for shelter. 
But a year down the line, government and many other stakeholders have been talking about it, saying there has been some change and they've done put some new measures in place to make sure this does not occur again. But we're looking at it from the perspective of people who are close to the incident and finding out if anything has changed for them since that incident. Joining us will be Queen Hazel. She herself was a victim of this gas explosion. And Eric, who is a victim's brother. So good afternoon, gentlemen and ladies, and welcome to Captured by Women. Yeah. Thank you, very Thank you very much. Queen Hazel, let me start off with you. You were at the incident. I would want, want to know what the experience was there. Okay. Actually, I wasn't present okay. when the thing happened. I was at the mall. I was having a meeting with my team members. I'm an artist. I'm an up upcoming artist, a musician. So I was having a meeting with my members, and then I had a call that we saw the lightning. So I, I was frightened. I didn't know what it was, but we were all speculating. It might be a car light or whatever. So I think 15 minutes later, I had a call that um, my mom has been um, smashed down by a moving vehicle. So I had to rush to the hospital. I got there and she was already dead. Yes, About yeah. that unfortunate when, incident. When this whole incident happened, the state made several promises to victims. Did you benefit in any way from any of these promises? I didn't. Nothing. They didn't even come to the house to find out how, what, what's next, what, how are we coping, how is the family and everything. I think it was only TV3 and then Radio Gold. They did a lot. Like They called in and then asked of how things are being done, um, what's the next step, and what are we doing, um, sending their condolences and everything. And then TV3 also came to the house and then they interviewed us on one or two issues. Come to Eric as well and involve you. What was your, the impact of this, you know, fire outbreak for you, your family? What was the exact uh, relationship with the person who passed away? Well, thank you very much. And um, that was October. Uh, it's exact one year and mm -hmm. we had this, um, it was very sad moment for us. and. We heard of our brother, uh, Mohammed. He works with the, um, at a Oman FM. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, he's a pres presidential staffer. Right. And um, so there's a day he was coming home, and then um, he was going to the office to tidy up, as in to come home because he has missed home. He doesn't come home often. Okay because of the work yeah, so yeah so um mm. he said oh, now we need to ask him permission from the you know before he come so when he was tidying up at the office so, uh, he heard then uh, boom so he called us before he, he called us before coming mm. so when he was tidying up he heard boom so hearing the boom as a journalist he need to rush up there and then you know just cover mm. what um, yeah what is going on so he bought in the food that he's going to eat and you know before you come out this bag he's taking his personal camera because the place have been locked okay. so mm. he didn't get the main this mm. camera that he used mm. up there so uh, what happened is i take his own personal camera the small one right. and he said mm. he's going so he went up there stand on the overhead and then you know narrating what happened and then so he was shooting or covering the place and suddenly, as in he was at the office and he had the first explosion. Right. Meanwhile, the second explosion is right. also coming. So he, I think he made the second explosion and he felt from the overhead to the ground. So how did you get to know that your brother was involved in that particular incident? Well, um, actually, he called us that he's coming home. Okay. Mm. But... But then we don't know that there's something like that mm -hmm. happened. What was the response from stakeholders after that? Did they contact your family to find out what they could do to support? Did they offer any support at all? Yeah, um, I, I, so far as he worked with the president, immediately we went to the... Um, so saw the president? It, yeah, 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 we went there. But before we get to the president, we went to the uh, uh, mortuary. Okay. That's okay. where our uh, late brother is, and then um, we went there. As we saw the, uh, we see our brother, and then um, on our way going back to the office, the president himself called, 
mm. um, Kennedy, Japan's wife, and then um, said he want to meet us, the family, and as in like to honor the, the family. Mm. So we went up there to the, uh, how do you call it, the Flastaff house, mm. and then the um, president talked to us, and he said he will be taking care of the funeral arrangements, and, and he's a Muslim. Mm. Uh, so we just do it back, back behind mm -hmm. this. Um, we just find everything out. So, yeah. so when we talk mm. about incidences such as these, after that particular blast, uh, there were a few speeches about policies that were sure that going forward we'll be able to prevent such occurrences from happening in Ghana. Do, do you feel that we are at a point where we'll be able to prevent any such disasters again in this country? Hmm. Yes, yes. Um, for we preventing such thing, um, I think uh, <laughs> um, is is something uh, actually. I don't even know how how to say about it. But uh, due to those or let's say the like owners of these gas uh, owners, <laughs> and due to the way they arrange their things. Or you can because somebody will just come to the roadside and just having a filling station. Mm -hmm. We buy there are people house houses around, yeah. mm -hmm. and it's very scared. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to do something about it. Yes, 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 yes. Thank yes, you. Yes. Yes, let me find out from you. I know it's. I think I can only imagine how it's been for you and also for 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 um, Eric. But one year on, I mean, how has how how is the family coping? How are you doing? Okay, um, for my family, um, my mom and I, we were the only females, so um, she's no more, so automatically all the responsibility and everything is done on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, um, reality hits you with things that you know mm -hmm. you don't deserve, mm -hmm. but it's amazing how you are able to um, the, the disasters, yeah. challenges, obstacles, everything. It has not been easy, like playing the role of a mother, a sister, a wife. That yeah. particular side of a wife, I had, I don't even know how to go. Because our mothers, they have a way of <laughs> dealing with issues in the house. But as young as I am, I wouldn't be so mm -hmm. equipped with mm -hmm. a lot of maturity mm -hmm. to, to yeah. Mm -hmm. So I do what I am able to do. Do you think or have you seen any change proactively from government, from individuals, even from ourselves in the way we respond to these things or how we're preparing ourselves against these, you know, casualties? Um, I think citizens have voices, but the government has the power. Mm -hmm. There are some things that you can talk, we can mm, mm. shout and scream and say whatever. Mm. If the government is not ready to change some things that are happening. We citizens, there's nothing we can do. Mm -hmm. This gas filling station owners are, are, are causing a nuisance in the country, even though we need gas yeah, to, to you way. know, I think gas filling stations shouldn't be with human beings. Mm -hmm. I always say this, we should find a way to create, I don't know if it's underground something that, I don't know, maybe we just, Allocate, yeah, and where it away from so you. when you want gas, they just bring it to you. As mm -hmm. we should find ways, we should call people. You can't do everything, right. you know. People have ideas, so you involve people, and then you come up with something that is going to benefit everybody mm -hmm. because they are not here with us, they are always there, mm -hmm. they don't know what we go through. Mm -hmm. It's really, really, as he said, scary because mm -hmm. right. if as you walk by the road, you can see like four gas filling stations. Mm -hmm petrol filling stations all on the same lane. That's risky. Right. It's really risky. We have to do something about it. The government has to do something about it. We certainly have to do something about it. But time will not allow us to talk more about this, but we certainly are commiserating with the families that lost loved ones in this attack of, you know, the explosion that occurred at the atomic junction. And we hope it doesn't happen again. We certainly hope we won't sit together like this to talk about such a disaster. Let's all in our small corner do something to change it. But ultimately, the power lies in government's hand to make sure the policies are implemented. On that note, we'll take a break. We'll be back with more here. Let's say a big thank you to Queen Hazel, who is a victim's daughter, and also Eric, who happened to be a victim's brother. Let's take a break. We'll be back.
Welcome back from the break. On Big Man 2, we are looking at the free SHS program and assessing its implementation one year on. To discuss this issue, we have been joined by Mr. Anis Hafa, who is an educationist and who would give us some insights about the free HSS program. Mr. Hafa, you're welcome to Captured by Women. Thank you. Um, first off, I'd like to find out from you, um, one year on reviewing it and seeing how we've come so far, the general feedback one gets is that there wasn't a lot of consultation during the uh, development of the program. Do you agree? Well, uh, I'm sure there was some consultation, but mm. of course, within a, a period of one year, there can never be enough consultation. This is something that has rolled out over a, a few years, and I'll begin to appreciate it. But then I also appreciate the apprehension, uh, because this is new. Mm -hmm. It's new to allow, it's new to this country, uh, because, you know, government has a responsibility to educate everyone from what we call K through 12, uh, from the age, up to the age of 18. You know, that's a government's responsibility. Uh, so we have to begin to appreciate that. Now, what I was surprised by mm -hmm. is that the, uh, the next year, which is what we've started now, mm -hmm. we had an additional 180 students mm -hmm. out of nowhere who are now wanting to enroll in secondary mm -hmm. school. And I thought that was dynamite mm -hmm. because where did they come from? Mm -hmm. And had it not been for the free senior high school, these would be the kids that we see on the streets mm -hmm. or engaged in some other activities and so on. But again, I can understand the apprehensions because these are new. These are new, uh, a, a new introduction. But then we make progress mm -hmm. only when we begin to look at our environment and then look at the way forward. I think that's where we are now. Mm -hmm. But what I keep saying is that this has to be a national issue. Right. It should not be a political issue. You know, many times I'm my own party A, party B, mm. and I say I don't care about any one of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. The important thing is this, I'm very concerned about the education or lack of education of our young people in this country. I'm very interested in how passionate you are about education because I'm sure you've been in it for long and you've seen how the changes have been. Mm. But also the apprehension comes with, you know, the idea that maybe it was too much of a wholesale policy, maybe especially with a, you know, free boarding. Maybe we could have started with free, um, doing just day school and then not for everybody. If, let's say, your parents are in a capacity to pay, why not? And then we'll do this for the less privileged people. What's your take on that? My focus is this. Again, you remember what I said earlier, there has to be a national effort. So I'm now addressing parents. Right. That here you are, your children are going to school for free. Wh mm -hmm. What is your contribution? Mm -hmm. It has to be a national effort. And by that, I mean that the, the districts have to be seen helping. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the teacher associations have to be seen helping. Mm -hmm. uh, the parents have to be seen helping. The regional ministers have to be seen helping. Mm -hmm. But again, we don't seem to pay enough attention to the education of our children. Right, right. But that is really uh, something that we, need, mm. we really need to do. Mr. Hafa, let's talk about the increase in enrollment, which obviously has caused logistics to fall short and resulted in the double track system we have right now. Do you think we failed to plan properly? Because we also have history to guide us. In the CPP era, we had free compulsory education, mm -hmm. which resulted in an increase in enrollment. And it became one of the biggest challenges for the CPP government. With history to guide us, do you think we could have planned better for the implementation of this policy? Well, you know, there's mm -hmm. always room for improvement. And there's also a, a time when you have to start. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think we have to do everything at the same time. Mm -hmm. I mean, now that, I mean, frankly, whoever thought that with the introduction of free senior high school, we're going to have another 880,000 mm -hmm. students come in. It was a shock to everybody. Mm -hmm. But it's a positive shock, a shock in a sense that Kids are desirous of education, right. you know. So again, the planet has to be consistent, you know, even how teachers themselves plan mm. to teach, you know, how prepared they are, mm. you know, the kind of logistics, as you say, that will support them to be successful. Mm. You know, right. we, we can't, teachers cannot teach in a vacuum. The environment itself has to be conducive. Mm. And I'm saying this from the point of view of some programs that I've done in particular districts where you really look at the conditions of the teachers mm. and ask yourself, my goodness, how does a human being mm. develop their confidence yeah. and develop their skills so they can pass it on? So again, like I say, we've started something new, but it has to be a national effort. Mm. But the other thing about politics that I don't like, and it's the same thing across everywhere, mm -hmm. is that when one party starts something, the other party that's in opposition want them to fail. Yeah. And then they come back 
and changes. the cycle continues. You know, so th that maturity is lacking mm -hmm. in our system. But our focus should be on the young people. God, they don't care. They don't care as long as th there's food for them to eat, there's water for them, there are toilet facilities, there are toilet papers and so on, and the teachers are prepared. I think that should be the focus of every person in the country. And you see the difference that that will make in this country. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about, um, obviously from your submissions, um, you, you, you are for the free HSS, but there the are genuine concerns that have come up. And the major one has to do with quality. So at the end of all, the end product for the free HSS program is to ensure that at the end of the day, the products that come out, uh, the students, uh, you know, um, are better, you know, uh, uh, tutored. They have the kind of skills and knowledge they need to transition into the next phase of the education. And there's been talk about the fact that with almost like the uh, bandwagon approach to the education system, quality at the end of the day will suffer. And um, I, uh, there's a lot of conversation about that as well, that yes, it's good, but quantitatively, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Qualitatively, it's, it's not, there's nothing to write home about. Your take? <laughs> <laughs> My take is that mm -hmm. we've been suffering from lack of quality for a long time. Mm. I'm, I'm but not going but to would we say this has worsened it in well, some we, sort? We, we, we don't know yet. But okay. the point is this, where does quality come from? Quality comes from, again, like I said, the preparation of the teachers themselves, right. mm -hmm. the environment mm -hmm. in which the teachers uh, operate, and the teacher and learning materials exactly. that are available. Mm -hmm. Now, the, again, quality also depends on the schools of education. Mm -hmm. That how well are you preparing the teachers to be successful in themselves mm -hmm. before they can pass on their own successes mm -hmm. to the young people. Mm -hmm. So the quality should really start there. And what I say is this, how on earth do we train teachers mm -hmm. in lecture halls? Think about that. Mm -hmm. You can never get quality education in this country if we continue teaching teachers in the lecture halls. So you ask yourself, why don't we teach teachers at the school sites? Mm -hmm. Like you were in medical school, mm -hmm. a lot of the work that you did, the hard work, was really in the polyclinics, mm -hmm. the clinics and the hospitals. Oh, yeah. We should adapt the same methodology for mm -hmm. training teachers. And then you ask yourself, mm -hmm. now this is the question now, you ask yourself, why are we not training teachers at the school sites? Go to the school sites and see if it's conducive for a professor, mm. a lecturer, you know, to leave the ivory tower, <laughs> to come down and teach in the dust. That's why they don't do it. Mm. If they have, uh, they have to, to use the bathroom, for example, where are they going to go? Behind the tree? These are the realities of what happens in this country. You know, and I'm talking from experience in terms of my exposure to places where I've taught in different parts of the world. And you compare it to Ghana, we've been independent since 1957. My goodness. So for <laughs> me, the problem is, if the free SHS hadn't started in this way, would we then now be focusing so much on the quality as against the quantity? Because rightly, like you're saying, the quality has been an issue from time immemorial. Yeah. And so are we, as a now, in your view, do you think we're taking a greater stance to make sure that changes or we're still sitting aloof? You know, there's a certain momentum. Mm -hmm. In, uh, you know, I've been involved with education in this country since 1995, mm -hmm. but I see a certain momentum and a certain determination mm -hmm. to add value to our school system. Mm -hmm. And we should all uh, be on a bandwagon. But again, let's look at the elements again. The, the key person is the teacher. Mm -hmm. Whether it's uh, year-round or uh, a term system, it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Because you can have a person sit and doing the same old thing over and over again. And if you extend the duration, like in my situation, mm. in secondary school, have they extended the duration of learning frame from four years to eight? <laughs> the chances are I'll still not be speaking it. <laughs> but if we do it properly, we mm. could be doing it in six months. Okay. And then you ask yourself, in lieu of uh, four years, you can do it in six months. What are you going to do with the three and a half years? Mm. That's when you begin to learn other skills. Mm, you know, right. look, challenges always offer the opportunities. Mm -hmm. And it's a classic case of what it is that we're experiencing in this country. Mm. And you ladies need to be on board. I'd like to see you on classroom teaching. We, we certainly will. Uh, <laughs> we can, for maybe point. that's a, a conversation for, uh, for another day. <laughs> well, on that note, um, we'll wrap it up for today. Um, it's really been a, a riveting conversation with Mr. Hafa. We hope you've picked a couple of ideas. And as he said, everybody, parents, communities, districts, must man up to the national effort and join the drive to they give our man children up and woman a up. woman up <laughs> to the drive to give our children the education they deserve. Please stay with us. We'll be right back.
When the history of the beauty industry in Ghana is told, there will be certain names that will feature highly on that list. One of those names is Rene Q. Boating. From the corporate world of Gillette UK to Zenith Bank Ghana, she took a break and went to study professional and celebrity makeup. She came back to establish a strong business that provides reliable full-scale beauty services. Along the line, she also discovered her talent in coaching women on their path towards self-actualization. In the middle of all this, she still finds the time to be philanthropic. So much so, she has adopted a charity home called Royal Seeds. We have Renee Kiu Boating in the studio with us, and she's going to talk to us about the world of beauty. Renee Kiu. Thank you so much. I was like, oh my goodness. Is that the word? Like, no, I don't. Thank you so much. That was really nice. Yeah. Thank you very much. So from Gillette UK to Zenith Bank Ghana. I work with Zenith Bank Ghana at a point, you by did. the way. You I you did. You have the look. <laughs> The Zenith look, really. So, um, at what point during your corporate career did you say to yourself, "I am ready to stand on my own feet"? I don't even know if I said that to myself, but I think what I did was I was really going with with how I felt, mm. and maybe I had like I had like an over expectation, so I was a bit disappointed. I wasn't fulfilled at work. I was doing a good job, but I wasn't happy doing the job. Mm. So I think I just you know at a certain point, I just thought this isn't for me. Um, let me let me do something else. And even when I left, I didn't know what I was going to do. Mm. So it was almost like a high risk. <laughs> you know, that is the entrepreneur in me. Mm -hmm. You know, I just feel something and I go ahead with my guts and everything. At the time, I just felt like this isn't for me, so I, so I just stopped. Hmm. Renee, mm. interesting, you talk about moving from, you know, business or let's say finance field to this, and you didn't even know where you were going, let's mm -hmm. see. So what in you made you feel that fashion industry or beauty at the time was a thing? Because I believe in your era, it wasn't too... It wasn't at all, no. It was exactly. No. So why but would you I've go into unknown loved... territories? Because it was needed. Okay. And I always advise young entrepreneurs now, if you want to have a successful business now, do what is needed. Okay. Then there'll be a high demand for it. You always sell out. Mm -hmm. Don't do what everybody is doing. Mm -hmm. Find a niche. A niche is a specialty. A niche is something that is known to you. Mm -hmm. So at the time, I just moved from the UK and I'd come. Like you can see, I really like colorful stuff. Mm -hmm. And at the time in Ghana, so I'm talking about like 12, 13 years, the only jewelry you could buy here was real gold or sterling silver, mm -hmm. which could be very boring. You just have like, you know, some simple chain with, mm -hmm. and also very expensive right, as well. Right. So if you're a young, you know, working class woman, you've just graduated, what, what, you probably don't have that money to go and buy that gold mm -hmm. or maybe that silver. Now, I was used to living in the UK and buying clothes and buying accessories to match. You know, at that time, you couldn't even get all these brooches and pin tags mm -hmm. and all of that mm -hmm. here in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Even if you did, you got the very classic gold or silver ones, wow. not colorful, vibrant things. You yeah. said initially that um, it was critical for women or for anybody who wanted to be entrepreneurial to do what was needed or mm -hmm. to fill a gap. But mm -hmm. I was going to ask you mm -hmm. whether passion didn't play a part. It so has obviously, to play a part. yes, definitely. There are so many gaps to be filled. Yes. I mean, just imagine mm -hmm. you can't fill any one of mm -hmm. them, and mm -hmm. you won't fill it well, and you won't make any difference if you don't have passion exactly. for what you're doing. Exactly. So of course, it's not so just. So you're naturally about, drawn to you know, beauty. But what are you drawn to? Mm -hmm. Now you're drawn to this industry. What is needed in that, that industry? industry? Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? So mm -hmm. like, there's you can, you can do anything, mm -hmm. but wh what would you specialize mm -hmm. in? You know, so you talked about me being a makeup artist as well. Now, I was doing accessories and then I started doing clothing as well. Right. Now, I'm a businesswoman. <laughs> like, you know, I am a proper, proper, I think I was born with it. Like, how am I going to make money? How can I make money out of something? Mm -hmm. Renee, I'm interested mm. in your upbringing because mm -hmm. for most people also in Ghana, they seem to be stifled. Well, now it's changing, but before they used to be stifled and even the environment comes to parenting your parent you have that creative idea but your parents is like no you have to go to school and make mm -hmm. sure you have a degree and follow through and I mean we weren't you know championing children we had talents so for you personally what was your view on growing up was there an environment that also helped you to get this far what helped me to get this far in terms of style and everything my dad is extremely stylish mm -hmm. I very very I mean his shirt his shoes he believes in quality mm -hmm. standard mm -hmm. so he always used to tell us it's better to have few quality things that will last forever yes. <laughs> very good quality especially mm -hmm. with shoes right. he can show you and shoes better. that he's had forever <laughs> leather 
proper shoes that you can wear than to mm. buy cheap things mm. and you keep replacing it. It's more expensive right. to buy, run, yeah. you know, so growing up and seeing him with his proper crisp shirt, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, then I have my fancy mother too and mm. then my grandmother who, like, I went to the market one time with her and she was looking through something. She saw a necklace and she said, my grandmother, ah, she and my grandparents were married for like 57 years. Wow. Now, my yeah. grandmother saw a necklace and said that it will match with the entomada that my grandfather oh, gave her on her engagement day, which she hadn't sewn yet. Oh, my goodness. So she that's bought that. that that's and a then whole we story went to right the house, there. Seriously. And then she brought like a box. Oh, Lord. And to two it, literally. <laughs> I mean, yeah. she brought everything out and found the cloth, okay. put the necklace on. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, was a perfect match. Perfect match. Yeah. So... I was born into style, okay. you know, my, fa my father's side, my, they, they're all very, very, very side. Mm. So I've always liked beauty and style mm. and quality. Mm. And there are several women watching us. Share with our viewers some tips. I mean, to become a confident woman, to become a woman of class, a woman that you can stand out among your peers, what should you do? What should you not do? How do you want to be seen and dressed in that way? Dress in the way you want to be addressed. Now, the way you dress would lead to how people also respect you. So you go to certain places sometimes. I sit back and I watch. I'm very observant. And I learn as well from what I see. Sometimes you see people um, fighting with ashes. I will sit in the front. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I am? They haven't read the invitation yet, but they've read your outfit. They've read your presence. They've read how you're carrying yourself. To them, they are thinking, Seno Gina Hono. This is not the person for the front. Mm. Back seat. Mm. Yes. And then you go somewhere to and because of how you're dressed, mm -hmm. they assume you are somebody's exactly. wife or you are the pastor's wife or you are the pastor. So you go to the pastor's conference, they want you to sit in front mm -hmm. and you're like, I'm not yes. a pastor. Mm -hmm. Yes. They will teach you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, right. if you're just joining us, you're watching Captured by Women on TV3. Dress as you want it to be addressed. Mm -hmm. My name is Nuang Falong. We're going to go for a quick break. When we come back, Captured by Women is still live. Welcome back. We're still in pink October month. And as you all know, we're celebrating breast cancer awareness because everyone has a sister or a mother or a friend who needs to get those breasts checked. Joining us in studio to discuss this very interesting topic is Dr. Nashali Dodo. She is the CEO for Nova Wellness Center. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing great. Excellent. Thank you for honoring this invitation. It's but let's pleasure. talk about breast cancer. For many people, especially young women, they are worried because when they touch their breast, there is some lump. So really, how do you know there's a lump that is different from the normal? How okay. would you go about that knowing? That's a great, great question. I'm glad you asked. You see, um, when we talk about the self-breast exams, a lot of people think we want you to be looking out for a lump mm. in your breast. But the purpose is to know your breast. Wow. That's really what the exam is about, not to find a lump and try to determine if it's mm. cancer or not, mm. but to really know how your breasts look like, how it feels like, what it weighs. You know, as a woman, you should know all these things so that when there's a change or something new happens, mm. if you're doing these tests regularly, then you can very quickly pick it up. Mm. You know, if there's um, a change in texture or color or that you feel something funny mm -hmm. if you've been examining your breast regularly then you're more likely to find it but most women don't mm -hmm. so that's where the problem comes in yeah. well hmm. so the talk about self-examination um, I mean especially in this month is one of the key mm -hmm. focal areas and Actually, I've seen on WhatsApp certain diagrams on how to go about it. Mm -hmm. Can you simply just walk us through sure. what we should do when we're okay. examining our own breasts? Absolutely. Yes. So, um, first of all, you want to pick a day within your menstrual cycle. And like Nanama mentioned, sometimes the breasts are tender, mm. um, usually when you're menstruating. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, not one of those days. Mm -hmm. But pick a day... Um, it could be your 10th day of the cycle, 20th day, when you're not ovulating or menstruating. Oh, okay. And, but always make sure you do it on that particular day, okay? Mm. Now, you want to um, do it in two positions. So you can be seated, and then you want to go circles with your arms open so that you can go all the way through 
the armpit area mm -hmm. and then you circle all the way until you get to the nipple area. Mm -hmm. Now with the nipple you also want to check if there's any discharge. That's also important because that could be a sign mm. of an infection mm. and other things. So you check if there's any nipple discharge. Then after doing the circles, you can also go vertically, just straight down mm -hmm. and up again, checking all the way through. Then after that, you can lay down. That's why I said two positions. So mm -hmm. you can lay down and check, or you can even stand up in the shower. Mm -hmm and then wet your fingers a bit with some soap and then again um, feel the breast around to make mm. sure that there's nothing in there. But when you say a lot of people are in the dark about mm -hmm. it, is there a particular lifestyle that encourages the growth of, of cancer in the breast? Is there something I can do to prevent the growth of cancer? Yes, um, it's, it's more common than most people know, like you're saying. I was reading this week and actually one in eight women really? are at risk. Okay. This leads me to an interesting question. I don't know if you've heard of the keto diet, <laughs> which is a high fat, <laughs> low protein and almost zero carb diet. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying the higher the fatty content of my diet, is this kind of diet encouraging? Because it's a very popular diet it these is, days. It is. And I personally don't recommend it. Mm -hmm. I don't. Um, Most you doctors need wouldn't really. <laughs> <laughs> right. The truth of the matter is you need a balanced mm -hmm. diet. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes to mm -hmm. and most of us don't eat a balanced diet you need your fruits you need your vegetables you need your carbohydrates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you do need fats and oils but anytime you have too much of anything that is where the problem comes in mm -hmm. so no i don't recommend the keto diet no. dr Dodo, let's talk about the breast cancer again where most people in our country uh, are, you know are scared of just the name mm -hmm. because there's so many myths surrounding it that once you're told you have breast cancer is doomsday you're mm -hmm. gone mm -hmm. Is that the reality with people and you've encountered? So most lumps that you may find in your breast are not cancerous, mm. actually. Mm. Um, they can be benign tumors. Mm. So yes, it's a tumor, it's a mass in there, but it's not a cancerous one. It's not growing. So no, if you find, um, if you're checking your breast and you find something, it is not doomsday. Um, you do need to go and get it checked. Mm -hmm. um, let your doctor check it. They may do a follow-up test. They may do a biopsy, check it out, see if there's anything else in it. Mm -hmm. um, they may do a mammogram, um, which is like an x-ray for the breast. Mm -hmm. And so the mammogram may determine if indeed. So no, if you find it, don't just sit with it and say, oh, there's nothing. At the same time, it's not you know, the end of the world. If it's caught early, mm -hmm. the good news is that a lot of the times, if it's caught early, there's treatment that can um, prolong your life. So, Doc, how often, um, aside the breast uh, self-exam, how often should we get clinically checked? Like, okay. what if, uh, say, you're in your 30s, I've heard if, um, when, uh, once you're 40 and above, I think every year or something, how exactly. often should we go to the hospitals to get our breast checked so what i recommend is when you go to do your yearly checkup do we do um, it we should <laughs> <laughs> because so we don't we, we um, don't. unfortunately mm -hmm. we don't have that habit of where we take ourselves to the yeah. hospital we don't we, do, yes. we don't and yes. that's that's a different mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. yes, yeah. yes, yes. that we we don't mm -hmm. do that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. our system doesn't even encourage mm -hmm. us on to that, do that note we'd like to say a very big mm -hmm. thank you to you dr nashley dodo for teaching us a, a bit more about breast cancer but the theme for this year is early detection effective treatment so make sure you catch that lump or that change in your breast early by doing regular self-examination you'll be able to pick that up and go and visit a doctor a professional at that to make sure they also help you through the process we'd like to say thank you to our sponsors nido gtp and yamvita we'll take a break we'll be back with more here on captured by women stay with us So soon we've come to the end of another show um, it's really been interesting and I know that you have picked up a few ideas and learned something new today let's recap what we looked and discussed today we first of all 
discussed the appalling trend of teacher-student sexual relationship and what must be done to eliminate it. Then we looked at the atomic gas explosion one year on, spoke to some victims to see how they're holding up after the disaster. And then on the career woman segment, we featured an amazing woman who was making strides in her industry. For lifestyle, we talked about breast cancer, what we can do to detect it early so that we can save the lives of our women. The show is sponsored by GTP Timeless, Yamvita, a delicious way to grow, and Nido. Thank you for staying with us. Enjoy your weekend and we'll see you next week. Captured by Women is brought to you by Yum Vita, a delicious way to grow, and Nido Fortigrow, your love, their future.